Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It's a beautiful day here in West Lafayette, Indiana, and I'd like to welcome all of you to this edition of the Boiler Engineers and a monthly fireside chat. My name is Arvind Raman. I'm the Executive uh, Associate Dean here at the College of Engineering. Dean Lundstrom is on international travel, and he asked me to host this panel in his stead. Here at Purdue Engineering, we strive for the pinnacle of excellence at scale. With 11,000 undergraduate engineers, nearly 5,000 graduate engineers, we are by far and away the largest engineering college that is also ranked in the top four amongst the very best in the nation. The, the depth, the scale and quality of student talent here is amazing. Purdue Engineering in particular has become a national magnet for talent uh, from coast to coast and internationally that are attracted here by an unbeatable combination of a top class education, affordability, and world beating research. The quality of students is tremendous, not just in engineering, but in the STEM disciplines and beyond. And a record number of them are graduating debt free or with very low debt. That combined with research innovations that are pumping out of our faculty's research laboratories makes this a combustible mix of ingredients that is really going to spark the next breakthrough growth in Boilermaker startups. Now, we would love for that breakthrough exponential growth uh, to happen here in Indiana, in the Hoosier State, making this into the startup heartland of America. But we are delighted with Boilermaker success, no matter where it happens in the world or outside the world. Um, regardless, when we look ahead to this exponential growth, what is very clear is that it is going to need uh, the presence of a strong and thriving Purdue alumni entrepreneurial network, which is the topic of today's panel. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce my co-host and moderator for today's panel, Bruce Schechter. Uh, Bruce is an advisor and our investor in a variety of technology startups, including Life360, Big ML, Carbon Lighthouse, and Illumio. Bruce started his career at Intel and spent nearly two decades there during the hyper growth years in many roles, including microprocessor product management and later serving as technical assistant to the senior VP of corporate strategy during the Andy Grove era. Bruce enjoys mentoring student entrepreneurs at both Stanford University and Purdue University and is active in nonprofit work, including his role as founder and president emeritus of the Intel Alumni Network and as co-founder and past co-chairman of Purdue SV Big, the Silicon Valley Boilermaker Innovation Group. Bruce received a BS in physics and mathematics from Purdue University, where he graduated with highest honors in Phi Beta Kappa. And much later, he was granted Purdue's Distinguished Science Alumnus Award. Nearly three decades after his undergraduate education at Purdue, he received an MS in computer science from Stanford. Bruce, over to you. Thank you very much, Arvind. Um, so, so we titled this event, uh, Amplifying the Purdue Alumni Entrepreneurial Ecosystem. So I just wanted to say briefly, real quick, some words about ecosystem. As you all remember from biology, ecosystem is a word that comes from biology and Webster defines ecosystem as a complex community of organisms and its surrounding environment functioning together as a unit. And I think what a great analogy for our desire. I mean, I, I, Arvin's already given the perfect speech, you know, like we wanna see a thriving environment in and around Purdue for fueling new and better startup activity there. So um, let me, I'm gonna start with the introduction of our panelists, but uh, first one thing about questions, uh, if you, we welcome questions. We'll, we'll try to get to as many of them from the audience as we can. So if you wanna put those in either the chat or the question window, I guess preferably the chat, that would be great. We'll see what we can get to later, primarily at the end. So let me fire, fire away with our excellent panel, all that I can count as friends of mine. First, Anand Iyer, who I've known much longer than any of the other panelists, that's a story in and of itself, but 
Onnit is a founding partner of Canonical Crypto, an early stage VC fund focused on Web3 and crypto infrastructure. He also recently joined Lightspeed Venture Partners, one of the premier Silicon Valley VC firms where he focuses on crypto infrastructure. Well before starting Canonical, he founded a company called Trusted, and we'll get a little chance to talk a little bit more about that later. It's a consumer marketplace, which was eventually acquired by Care.com. Um, and moving along, um, Adam Weinstein. Uh, uh, Adam is an investor and entrepreneur who most recently helped lead the product team at a company called Data Robot, following their acquisition of a company called Cursor that Anand had founded and served and led as CEO. Prior to that, um, Adam was leader on LinkedIn's analytics team and head of data and analytics at Bright, an AI-powered recruiting firm that was eventually acquired by LinkedIn, thus leading to Adam's joining LinkedIn. Now, let me just take a break and say there's, there's two different cohorts of panelists here. Anand and Adam are people who graduated Purdue, took more traditional jobs, and years later started companies. Well, not too many years. You guys are all way younger than me. But, but then the other two, which I'm going to be introducing here in a moment, Candace and Joe, either founded their company at Purdue as students or at least uh, envisioned the idea of their company while still at Purdue. So with that, uh, Joe Watkins is co-founder and CCO chief customer officer of a company called Socio that I suspect many of you have heard of. It's an end-to-end -end event management tool with a focus on attendee engagement. A year ago, congratulations, Socio was acquired by Cisco Systems and Socio is now known as WebEx Events. Um, Joe studied computer and electrical engineering at Purdue and was very active in student entrepreneurship activities, including hackathons and the Anvil, it, all, another set of topics I think we will try to talk more about later. Uh, Joe can probably say that he personally wrote a good portion of the code that became the first version of the product socio. Finally, and far from least, Candace Z is co-founder and CEO at VO. Uh, VO provides shared micro mobility programs in more than 50 cities around the U.S. and is growing very fast. Candace got her BS in finance with distinction at Purdue, where she was extremely active in extracurricular activities. Too many to mention now, but I, I was intrigued by Salsa Club, which I wish we had more time to talk about. But anyway, in her copious spare time, she served as a consultant at the Purdue Foundry to help startups develop their concepts and their uh, business plans. So what a, what a great panel on our topic. Um, I want to first dive in by going around and talking to each of you a little bit about the creation story behind the companies that you founded. Um, I'm, I'm kind of intrigued most to, by something. I'm going to go to you first, Candice, because you, you told me that the idea you came up with at Purdue for VO, but eventually I, you went and took real jobs I, I, that's, that's a lingo term, real job. And then later, or soon thereafter, came back to Purdue to found the company. Can you say more words about that and why Purdue, which is so interesting to me that you came back? Yeah, um, thanks for having me here. And thank you for the intro, Bruce. I will say for this idea, when I was a student at Purdue, I live in Hilltop and Krenna, it's like a mile away. Every, every morning I took bus to Krenna. And if not, I will walk to Krenner. Mm -hmm. And I always look for a term of transportation. And I, I'm not at a position to afford a car at that time. And car parking is very expensive. So there's no a better solution when I was on campus. And that issue amplified when I moved to Chicago to start my first job. Um, when I was a single woman there, and I find transportation is not very convenient and also safe. Public transit is not very reliable and you need to meet your schedule to fit their schedule. And it, when it comes pretty late night, it, it's a little bit unsafe for a single woman to take public transit. And walking outside sometimes can also be also very slow. Um, driving is also a very expensive option with all the parking. Um, and Uber, if you take it every day, especially for last two mile transportation, it can become pretty expensive as well. So I was searching for something that can be convenient, safe, and I didn't have anything in the city. 
And when I chatted with my friends, and I do think there's a lot of people with the struggle when in terms of like lot of smell transportation. So I have the idea and I chatted with my co-founder and he was a bike engineer at Trek at that time. And we felt like this is something we need to create and want to address. And Purdue seems to be a perfect location that uh, if we start a company, we can use Purdue as the, um, the, the location that we can build out our business case and also operation model. So we decided very quick and quit our real job and came back to Purdue building our like prototype business plan and started our market entry plan at that time. Great. Okay, um, good. And so Joe, um, I recall a story that I don't remember if it was you or one of your co-founders co told me long ago, but I believe that the origination of Socio came from a couple of you went to an event and you found it just disorganized and you thought somebody ought to organize this better. Is there any truth to this apocryphal yeah, uh, story? <laughs> there's almost like two stories in one there, but the very first one was actually Purdue BGR, B, uh, BGR week. So the Boulder Gold Rush refreshment. Um, the first event we went to um, as founders and we kind of realized that you had all your phones and all these people were trying to connect and you had to kind of get your phone, hand it to somebody in a group, they had to pass in a circle, they wrote their phone number, they put their Twitter in there and everyone was passing their phones around and we're like, well, there's, there's got to be a better way to do this. Uh, so that's that was the first inception of how to like network better, connect people better in the very beginning. And then uh, that grew one day to see, hey, why can't we run bigger events even better and even more events that we attended? Um, and the the one of the key things in between that is we took that idea at the Anvil that you were talking about, Bruce, earlier. And within 48 hours, we built the first version where you could just take your phone, shake your phone and connect with everyone around you in a quick circle so that you didn't actually have to uh, type your phone numbers in one by one. And that was the very first version of Socio before we uh, kind of became an end to end event management system. Okay, fantastic. Um, so, Adam, um, when you uh, envisioned and helped co-found Cursor, I, I, I'm thinking of all these stories that each of you have told me, but Adam, if I recall correctly, there was some element of you had worked at a bigger company, and I think you recognized a problem that ought to have a solution, and eventually you came back and solved it. Is that correct? Yeah, no, no, spot on. Uh, so I spent most of my life in, you know, early stage world. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd recently been kind of acquired into LinkedIn uh, from Bright, but most of my life had been at rather small organizations where, you know, if you had an answer to a question, you couldn't throw a ball and hit the person that knew the answer, like you were probably doing something <laughs> wrong. And so, you know, arriving at LinkedIn, where you had a globally distributed workforce and hundreds of people doing the same role or similar roles, right? Um, you know, knowledge was much more fragmented. And so, uh, being like an analyst, so I you know, wrote a lot of SQL, a little bit of Python, things like that. Um, I, I was struggling to find you know, answers to data questions that I thought should be pretty easy to answer. Uh, and we didn't really have a great you know, source of truth for a lot of these things. We had you know, some reports and dashboards and Tableau and things like this, but nothing was really documented all that well. And so after like, uh, you know, asking tons of folks on Slack uh, and collecting a nice little repository of, of answers, I basically posted it uh, in a little bit of like a Q&A app internally uh, that then a bunch of people uh, started using uh, without kind of me sharing it all that well. Uh, and so I realized like, okay, maybe there's 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 something here that, you know, folks that work with data on a daily basis that are writing a lot of kind of ad hoc exploratory code need a better place to find it. Um, and so that that was kind of the, the genesis for Cursor, right? It was a problem I had that, you know, kind of solved with a, a poor man's app internally that we built in like a weekend. And then, uh, realized, okay, maybe this could be useful to other large organizations as well. Um, and so, yeah, very, very similar, I think, to, you know, seeing a transportation problem or, or hearing, a, you know, I remember BGR quite well, like, you know, but but uh, I think, you know, as long as you have passion and some, some insight into how to solve it, you know, the rest is just elbow grease. <laughs> Good. Uh, so, Anna, finally, uh, your company trusted, uh, if I, there, my recollection is, there was an element of um, necess uh, necessity is the mother of invention because you were a new parent. Um, so could, could you tell us that story? Yeah, definitely. So um, 
you know, there's there's a, a, a sort of a sequence of things that kind of form the confluence of trusted coming together. One of which was obviously necessity for my wife and I, where we saw the landscape and we're like, you know, there's there aren't enough marketplaces or opportunities for us to find care, whether it's child care, elder care. You know, the spectrum is pretty pretty vast and large. But the, the sequence of things that also contributed to the timing being great for starting Trusted was, uh, you know, we were at the cusp of understanding or coming to terms with getting into a random person's car to be transported from one place to another or staying in someone else's home, right? And so Airbnb or Uber and Lyft and these sorts of concepts were starting to pave the way for how we think about marketplaces, number one, but also second, you know, the uh, mobile was taking off in a big way. And so uh, I think from a timing perspective, we felt like there was a, an interesting opportunity. Obviously, yes, to answer your question, Bruce, absolutely. You know, we were new parents living in a big city, uh, no family nearby, trying to figure out childcare, uh, daunting uh, task for, for many different reasons. And so th that was the spark, but also I think timing and luck were, um, were also big uh, ingredients in, in trusted coming together, but also becoming a success. Great. Okay, um, let's move along to I, a lot of our conversation moving forward would be a, around what, if any, role Purdue played or the Purdue network played in each of your um, founding founder experiences. Um, Joe, I wonder if you could start. Uh, tell me, I, 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 I guess I'm trying to, forgive me if I'm trying to put words in your mouth, but I think there's a story here about mentors that you found that challenged you to think big yeah that, that's a big one with uh the sv big group uh so silicon valley big group there um but the list is quite large like i think on the first time we we're talking uh bruce and, and just catching up was uh i actually kept remembering more and more and more instances of the purdue ecosystem and just how vast it was um there the first thing to call out right away is there was something by the Anvil and partnered with the Foundry it was actually that's what ran the hackathon that our team came together right and we ran with. Um, from there we met our first investor who was in the Purdue ecosystem that actually got us to actually start and incorporate the company and decided to do that. Um, from there we kind of uh, had an initial conversation with Guru from Lightspeed member of SV Big and a uh, great guy great mentor and um, really helped us throughout multiple difficult parts of the company. Uh, where where he had a very fun and interesting way of looking at things. He deals with a lot bigger companies than a small Purdue company from day to day, but still <laughs> gave us a lot of uh, direct feedback way back when we were just a group of founders. And one of the things he said was, if you're going to start a company, you have two options. Like you can just start a company and have a regular old company, or you can build an excellent, amazing, world-class company. You're going to spend a lot of time. You're going to spend a lot of hours. You're going to spend a lot of sweat and tears regardless. So which one do you want to build? Right. And, and having that really earn, I think, like early on, really led us to take some huge swings, like challenging ourselves, figure stuff out, push through boundaries that everyone acted like were there, but you could just run through them sometimes. Like there's some really great things from that. Um, and I, I would say that that was super, super beneficial. And um, that owner of the Anvil and the Foundry back in the day was our first advisor as well. So at many, many points that were difficult, it's so helpful to bounce ideas off of uh different types of people um they're never going to have all the direct answers for you but their insights and points of view are like invaluable um and the the list also continued on quite a bit in the purdue ecosystem just to um the person i started my first company with which actually crashed and burned and went bankrupt uh luckily not too much money but he ended up coming back later and uh being our series a invest series seed investor actually um and saving mm -hmm. us from a huge uh potential loss in control of the company so I could go on and on for a while there, but just a couple instances of, hey, if I didn't have those connections from my Purdue days and undergraduate days, um, I don't know if the company would be where it is. And a lot of that is just due to the Purdue network and ecosystem um, surrounding us with mentors and advisors, and then just people to bounce off of ideas from and that uh, allowed us to get investors as well, Bruce. Great, fantastic. So uh, Candace, how about, how about your perspective? Very same question. Um, wh what was impactful from the Purdue network for your the beginning of your company? I agree with a lot of points Joe just mentioned. <laughs> and when we started a company, um, no one knows what is Douglas bike share or scooter share. 
And people look at myself and my co-founder and thinking, where does this two kiddo coming from? And they have no track record. And not sure if they understand the product and working with the government contracting process. So to come to where we are here, we did get a lot of support from Purdue Network. First of all, all of our funding team, we are coming from Purdue. Uh, my CDO is a master's student from computer science. My co-founder was a uh, like mechanical master's student from engineering team. And we also hire a lot of people right now. We still have them from Purdue Alum Network um, to start the company. And then we get a lot of support from Foundry. They have excellent like entrepreneur in resident program. And we got a lot of um, suggestion and to get our business start. And when we are looking to uh, raise funds, we also get in, engaged with SBB Group, uh, which Bruce here inside as well. And we met uh, our first investor from that group. And at, at the beginning, his suggestion is that don't do that. But at over like one to two years, um, he see our progress and he bought in what we were doing. He actually became our first in institution um, like investor to fund our Sears Ape um, like last year. So I do think there's a lot of great things coming from Purdue. But my suggestion is that you need to utilize it and also maintain those relationships. Fantastic. That's good. And he speaks very highly of you to me as well, <laughs> not to mention any names. Um, okay, so let's see. And then Adam, Adam, how about in your case, it's a very different world for you because again, yeah. you're long gone from the Purdue network, but how about just influential people from Purdue in any way, shape or form over your years that yeah. might've yeah. contributed? I'll actually go back to like time on campus, which like you just said, it, it dates me a little bit, but um, you know, I think it, I started off as a CS student, uh, you know, computer science, and I guess I'm the imposter here on the call, right? I don't actually have an engineering degree. Um, <laughs> so I started, started in CS and then um, ended up, uh, you know, basically dual degreeing in, in CS and industrial management. Um, and there was a guy who was a professor at the time, uh, sort of like almost retiring named Arnie Cooper, who was uh, kind of a legend in, in you know, school of management, uh, but but I was trying to you know figure out whether or not I should stay in CS, whether I should add industrial management, whether I should make e either one a minor or a major, and he kind of took me through this you know like like almost behavioral assessment. I, I don't think I realized it at the time that I was kind of the subject of it, but just to understand where my passions were and what what I wanted out of you know a career. Which I mean, asking me at age whatever nineteen, I think I probably was at the time, wasn't exactly a uh you know scientific thing but um really made me realize that you know I, I think i needed a bit of both um that you know i loved and, and will always be passionate about technology but that like the the, the human aspect and like the, the business building aspect is something that i probably will will also uh like equally and um he was just a great you know advisor for you know even just a few times i i met with him um but you know time at purdue i think taught me a lot of like grit. Um, I think, you know, CS, engineering, um, a lot of the sort of scientific disciplines at Purdue, I would say, you know, they're intended to be a little bit of a grinding type experience. And that's helpful um, to like what you, you, you feel in a startup. Uh, like it's startups don't have, you know, it's not all rosy, even though TechCrunch might make you think that. Um, and so that, that was a bit of it. And then when I, if you fast forward, when we moved out West, uh, you know, 10 plus years ago, um, it's amazing, like if you start networking uh, professionally, Purdue uh, grads, and, and I, would, I would actually extend this to Big Ten grads. Um, Purdue is by far the best, but nonetheless, I think Big Ten <laughs> as a whole is, is fits, fits the mold, are all super warm and, and willing to help. There's just sort of a, I don't know if it's the Midwest mindset, although now we've got UCLA and whatever else, but, um, but like, I think there's just a, a willingness to help um, that doesn't, always exist in, in every part of the country or world. And um, I mean, Bruce, you you and, and the SV Big Group have been a great part of the network. Um, I think, you know, beyond that, like I have tons of folks from LinkedIn, from Data Robot, from elsewhere that, you know, were Purdue grads that I wouldn't have known and didn't know, but like we're still um, really, really helpful as, as much as they could be. So long answer, but um, Purdue's had a lot of, uh, you know, intersection with, with life. Great. Okay, and on and finally, same question. By the way, I have to say, I mentioned I've known you longer than anybody else on the panel, and and I would say that's in large part because we're fellow Purdue. I, you were working at at Microsoft, and I, you spoke at a big Microsoft 
technology event of some kind. And I thought, I want to meet that guy. So anyway, that's the beginning of our relationship. Um, so yeah, any Purdue, Purdue people in any way, shape or form that formed your career along the way, especially your ability to found your company. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll try to keep it succinct, but I mean, the, the reality is that I don't think a day goes by when I don't think about Purdue or like conversations that I have with someone where Purdue doesn't come up, right? It's, it's a part of, it's a part of who I am, right? It's my, um, it's, it's my, it's my, it's been morphed into my DNA. Uh, but it goes back to, uh, I think 1999, I think there was a, a, a job fair when I met this individual from Cisco systems and he's like, oh, you know, and of course, um, I, I grew up in the nineties, you know, obviously rode the internet wave and, as a, as a junior at Purdue, uh, I met I met this gentleman. And he said, "Hey, you should come work at Cisco because you know, given the sort of like the skill set that you have, and I think you'll be a good fit for our team." And uh, this guy obviously was a was a Purdue uh, Purdue grad. Um, he he'd gotten his master's from uh, uh, in CS from Purdue, and he's the one who recruited me into Cisco. And you know, as a as a junior and as an immigrant having moved to this country, the Silicon Valley was like everything that I you know it's where I wanted to be. Right, so getting this opportunity to interview with his team, let alone moving to the Valley as a junior. I took a whole semester off actually and ended up becoming more of a co-op than an internship. But that was sort of the beginning of my exposure to the Valley, uh, which as, uh, as we all know, is sort of like the birthplace of a lot of innovation. So if it weren't for him, um, and again, like timing and luck uh, in many ways, I wouldn't be here. And I'm still very close to him. He's, he's still a very big personal mentor of mine. His kids yeah. have grown up and it's insane. Like I, it's been 22 years now and, uh, we're still very, very close. So, uh, yes, uh, I'm I'm indebted in in so many ways uh, to the you know the Purdue network, but also these individual connections I've made, whether it's you, Bruce, or Ron, who recruited me uh, back in the day from Purdue. It's been um, quite a quite a journey. Great, fantastic. Um, I'd like to follow on the same vein as what we've just talked about, but. Um, like how to use the Purdue network. And I'm uh, Joe, I think there might be something you can share because I remember when we talked earlier, you talked about it just being, if you're gonna start a company, that's your natural network of where you're gonna find talent. Is there any more, and and by the way, how do you, how do, you do that? Uh, you know, like if you're looking for talent at Purdue, it's not gonna just show up at your door. How did you do that? Yeah, there's there's quite a bit to that. I think a lot of that is just getting involved. I think um, I usually say like just taking chances with stuff, like go do some hackathons, even if you don't always have the idea. There's a ton of uh, communities at Purdue that are entrepreneurial. That's how I met one of my co-founders, and then hey, he met me, he introduced me to the other one, and that's how we get into the hackathon. Is just doing some things, um, and then making sure that you kind of actually do them, not just a project, but hey, go try to actually sell sell a product or create something. Um, I think that that, that has been very, very beneficial. Um, and really it's, it's important, I think, to get off of campus. I don't like to understatement that, but it's like, there's a lot of stuff right outside of the campus walls where is then that's where a lot of stuff is happening with, um, Purdue, uh, innovation park. Um, there's a lot of companies and advisors that are right across the river actually. And I was kind of shocked when we met them and they later invested in us, uh, and things of that nature. Where I'm like, well, there's a 200 person company by a Purdue founder right here. And he was willing to talk to us any day of the week, just to try to help somebody out. Um, and all of that just came from going to events around and in the community. So take advantage of a lot of the things going on on campus. Um, and take advantage of things going on around campus. It does take some effort uh, to do those things and make sure you, you follow up, you get people's phone numbers, and then you you make big ass when you need them and, and people usually answer. Um, and I think one of the, the main things I like to focus on there is like, the one thing that I just feel I get less and less of every single year is like, hey, the ability to find great people, right? And if you, if, if you squander that opportunity while you're at Purdue or shortly after Purdue, um, I think that that's, that's a big thing you, you shouldn't try to let go to waste is the amount of great people that we got involved with. And just like Adam said, how nice they are, how willing they are to give advice um, is actually amazing. And sometimes they know when not to give advice uh, and say, hey, this is something I can't answer. Like that, that, that was completely invaluable. And I would say is uh, something that everyone should focus on. Great. You know, I will say one personal comment. You mentioned hackathons. The last time I was on campus, uh, 
you may have heard there was a big pandemic. So I haven't been there for a long time, but it was like at least three years ago. But there was so much talk among students about hackathons. And, and I'm, I think that, I mean, it seems to be a real, I don't know if it still is three years later, but it seems to be a real Purdue thing. And what a great way to kind of get your uh, feet wet or your hands dirty, whatever analogy you want to use, uh, to pretend like you're building something real. And in fact, maybe it turns out to be real. Um, so Candace, uh, I want to basically give you the same question I just asked Joe. I, I remember you, we, you mentioned that you were recently, I don't know how recently, but you were back at Purdue and you were surprised that students you talked to just weren't aware of resources they had on campus. And therefore, is there anything you could share to us? I'm sure there must be many aspiring entrepreneurs on the, on the video call here at Purdue. So what advice do you have to the students? Yeah, that's a very good call. When I uh, came back to Purdue this April, I spoke at Craner at their executive forum, and I did a very quick poll and find out only one fourth of the students in the audience know about Foundry, Enval, et cetera. And I was very surprised because Foundry actually have a very great system called Firestarter. When you like contact them, they can help you to flush out all of your ideas and they have different EIR with different specialty, understand how to build out the business. That is actually where we started. And Foundry is so warm that they just take us in after we send an inquiry and started to offer different resources they have and also connect us with a lot of amazing people in Purdue Network. So I do think there's a lot of resources available at Purdue, but we just need to um, go out to find it. Because for example, for what I noticed that the reason why I get engaged with a foundry is because when I was undergrad, I look for projects and I know there's some needs from Purdue Foundry with their startups. So I volunteer to be in and help on the financial modeling. And I also know there's a lot of entrepreneurship certificate classes people can go through just to learn about entrepreneurship, understand like what is the what it takes to build a business. Great. Okay. Um, let's maybe, I, I'm a big believer in the value of mentorship. And um, I wonder if I could, uh, let's see, go to Anna next and ask you about any advice you'd offer to either Purdue students or just any anybody listening who's an aspiring entrepreneur. What, what advice would you give them about mentorship? How, how do you find them? And how do you really make use of them? I mean, it's not a nat I don't think it's a natural thing for people to know how to, um, to form that kind of relationship. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And uh, I feel like the landscape is changing pretty drastically because I think the, um, you know, if I were to sort of look, look back at sort of my own trajectory, first of all, I think I had some inhibitions about reaching out to people. And I think the, in the likes of LinkedIn, we're, we're really quite there when I was graduating, right? So we, it, was, it was really, you know, your, your email was your CRM, was your network, right? Like that's as far as things got. <laughs> um, but uh, now, of course, there's, there's many tools to be able to connect with, uh, with folks. Uh, honestly, if, there's, if I could just pin it down to one thing, I'd say, and there have been many Purdue grads I've met this way who have just been very direct about reaching out, saying, hey, you know, I am an ECE grad, I'm looking to do this, I'm moving to the Valley, would love to catch up and talk to you about X. And I, you know, as, as much as my email and schedule permits, I will, I will respond and we have a, a candid conversation about whatever it is that happens. So I think the, honestly, it's, it's not, I don't want to overly complicate it, but it is really, I guess it's, it's a two-step process. One, you know, uh, harness and canvas the landscape of your networks and find the, the three or four people, maybe even more uh, that, that you want to really get connected to where you feel like you can get good value from them. Um, script your ask, make it super succinct, right? Like here's the three things I want to discuss with you, right? Like and put that in an email, whatever the case might be, maybe something that makes it pop so that like the other person feels compelled to respond. And then, you know, keep up, keep up the conversation, right? Like keep at it. Um, and make it, uh, when, you, when, you, when you wrap up the conversation, once you've had it, close the loop such that it feels like you can give something back to the mentor as well, right? So it's always sort of a two-way street. So, but, you know, the, I think you were asking sort of about the top of the funnel, like how do you find people? But honestly, I think the tools are there, right? It's just about 
um, you know, putting it to work for yourself and, and making, you know, just adding a little bit of extra effort, right? Like uh, I found, um, I found great people through Twitter, uh, through LinkedIn. And, uh, you know, the next step is just about sending that cold message and, and not, not worrying about how it might be received or even, you know, even if the, even if the reception or response rate is low, just keep at it. No, that, that's a, that's a great topic. I, I, and I would say, I, I'll share that so many times I've talked to entrepreneurs where not just necessarily just from Purdue, but like I tell them, go search LinkedIn and especially find somebody who went to the same college you did and reach out to them. It can be a cold email via, via LinkedIn, whatever. But if you passionately talk about, I'm so thrilled that we're both fellow alumni, I think, you know, the hit rate on these are going to be, well, there's going to be a lot of rejection, but the hit rate is going to be not bad. Um, Adam, do you have any more to share about like if, if you were, maybe from your own personal experience, but if you were advising young entrepreneurs about finding mentors, what would you say? Yeah, I mean, part of this just goes back to like, what is mentorship? And I sort of think of it as, you know, learning and growing, um, mostly professionally in, in, in my case, but there's, there's other angles of it too. And, um, you know, I, I think I look at like the people that I found to be most like inspirational and enlightening or, you know, educational, uh, mostly the people I've worked with, um, certainly investors and, and others that like kind of, you know, been a part of life as well, have, have fit that, that bill. But um, I don't think everybody, ever, anybody ever explained to me like, okay, what, if you want to seek out this entrepreneurial path, how do you like, what, what's the best way to get started, right? You can start your company, you, you can go work with a bunch of really bright people. But what I ended up, you know, inadvertently doing was just, I mean, when I moved out for bright, you know, it was a job site, I had no experience in the space. But I was just blown away by the three or four people that were at the company um, when I interviewed there. Uh, they were backed by the same investors as Exact Target, and you know they were just like out of this world smart. One dropped out of high school. One, uh, the, other, the other didn't go to Purdue, but like like both like incredibly brilliant. And like I learned a ton from them. And, and if that's all I get out of a company or a startup or a company, even if it doesn't, doesn't succeed, I think it's you know, super super valuable. Um, so I. I that, that's one thing. You don't have to necessarily formally ask. You don't have to do anything, but you, just being around people that are, you know, special or, or have some deep expertise is, is really, really, really fun. Um, yeah. And, and, and to Anand's point, like, you know, ask for sure um, you know, if you have a special need or, you know, a pointed interest. Um, and yeah, I, I think, you know, Purdue is a great ecosystem as well. Like, I think I, I probably didn't take advantage enough of it. I don't think there was a there wasn't a guide, there wasn't a social network, there was barely a website um, in terms of looking up <laughs> things, uh, you know, hey, I want a resource for X. I mean, today, all that stuff is is searchable, easy to find. But um, back then, I think ITEP had, you know, some semblance of a directory, but it, it, it wasn't all that great. <laughs> uh, so, okay, good. Um, so very soon, uh, we, we're going to switch over to Q&A. And we have a fair number of questions here, so so we're off. But please, audience, please, please uh, tell us what you want us to talk about. Um, Candace, I think a really important topic uh, is that, uh, how do I say this? I think that it's pretty well documented that female entrepreneurs have a bigger challenge than male do, unfortunately. And I, because, I mean, you've I've I've read the articles, you know, about you and your role as CEO at VO, VO. So what advice would you like to share with young women, younger or aspiring entrepreneur women to wade through this? Yeah, that is the big F in the room. I will say I work in the transportation industry and which is very heavily male dominated. And also I'm an immigrant. There's a lot of, and I'm a first time entrepreneur. So there's a lot of unfavorable tag on my like shoulder that is not favorable for VC perspective. But I do get a lot of support along my road to today, especially getting through like support from mentor, uh, Purdue alum network, understand what, ha what has been successful for them and learn from them. Like, how can I do um, to be successful in leading the team and the company? So I will like defer to the, the common uh, we just discussed on the mentorship. But the, the other thing I want to also mention is that um, reach out to people, reach out to mentor, but also we need to like spend energy 
to maintain their relationship because that is two way streets and you need to spend calories um, to maintain the, um, the relationship you had with your mentor. For example, come prepared to your meetings, uh, share people your updates and keep people warm, keep the relationship warm or things will fall through and things will not like cultivate naturally. So I would say for women, especially, I will look for groups who support each other, who offer help to each other, and also um, in your day-to-day -day champion for what you believe in, and also address the topics you feel like it's not fair, or things you can like talk about, discuss for. For example, in my company, we believe we need to serve for all different um, like different demographics and women has a very special and unique need in micro mobility. And I took the role and champion for the product design product line. And that is something everyone uh, can do um, in, in the real life as well. Great. Okay. Uh, one last prepared question I have before we move on to Q and A um, on it. I'm trying to think how to phrase this, but you told me something when we talked during the prep about um, you think entrepreneurs need to not not expect to be taught for for example like at a school you don't expect the coursework to tell you how to be an entrepreneur and you're going to figure it out yourself uh, share with me your feelings on this topic yeah um i think someone alluded to this earlier uh during this chat as well but i think you know i think of it as shots on goal Right. I think you just need to try a lot of different things and um, just build the muscle on uh, on what it's what it's what it means to be an entrepreneur. And that only comes from trying um, and, and actually do practically doing things. Right. So you can get a lot of top down uh, content and education. I think you can get some guardrails and frameworks on things that you can do and, and, and landmines to avoid or pitfalls to avoid. But. At the end of the day, like, you know, there's when, when you're in the driver's seat, it's kind of like, you know, it's, it's kind of like getting schooled in what it's like to drive a car. When you drive a car, there's a lot of the variables that will show up when, you, when you're actually on the road. Um, and so, yes, you can you can you can hear a lot, you can read a lot. And there's no shortage. I think Adam alluded to TechCrunch or, you know, other networks where I think folks are very open about their journeys, but everyone's journey tends to be different. So, um, yeah, my my. I think just given all the tools we have today to start something, um, and I, I, you know, I know there's a big asterisk on this because if you start a deep tech hardware company, for example, like that's a, a different ballgame. But if you're starting something in software, for example, like it's actually much easier to do that today than it was, you know, five years ago, ten years ago, twenty years ago. So um, I think it's uh, and it keeps going down, right? So I would say that uh, yeah, just try it out. You know, take take the plunge. Uh, dip your toes in and maybe you start to get more comfortable and you get to go deeper but uh, these things matter and I think now as, as someone who's who spends a lot of time talking to founders and figuring out if there's an opportunity for us to work together as an investor I, I the first question I tend to ask them is you know tell me your founding story like how did you get here what have you tried before what have you failed at uh, and oddly enough this is something I talk to my daughter about who's nine now all the time which is you know <laughs> tell me something you failed at this week right which is and I, and I want that to be okay for us to talk about like failure is is fine but it doesn't happen unless you take shots at goal so um yeah a long-winded way to say try 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 things and, and challenge yourself great okay um arvind i believe you've been watching the the questions coming in and and we'll i'll turn the mic over to you to to offer them up Yeah, we have a number of questions. Uh, please keep them coming in the remaining time. Um, I'll start at the very top here. Um, the question is that uh, I've been thinking a lot about personally owned versus shared micromobility. If someone uses shared micromobility regularly, it ends up costing more than purchasing a scooter or bike after a few months. What are your thoughts about shared micromobility going forward to really be affordable for the first and last mile solution? Uh, and not just affordable for a fun way to travel around on vacation. Candace, I suppose this is for you. Yeah, happy to, happy to uh, answer this one. And it's a very good insight. And personally, myself, have been thinking about this question a lot. The analogy I would use is that even though every, a lot of people still have cars today, we are still heavy users for Uber and Lyft. 
I would say the convenience of share micro mobility is kind of unbeatable when you compare it with the personal owned one. So from our end, the responsibility for the company like us, it's our goal to reduce the cost and make sure our um, commuting user, they're not like incur so heavy costs and that the economics can be justifiable for them. So there are a lot of things we are rolling out on the pricing side, we are pushing for direction to make commuting trip more affordable and make sure we are able to cultivate the habits of using micro mobility going forward. Thank you, Candice. Um... Bruce, the next question is regarding students. Uh, one of the most common questions received from a student is, uh, quote unquote, I do not know what I want to do. Uh, so what are your suggestions and when did you realize you wanted to become entrepreneurs? Oh, well, let's see, who, who, who would like to take that one? Oh, Adam, got it? Go ahead. Yeah, Adam, go I'll, I'll, it. I'll give you a two cents. So, uh, you know, I started off as a consultant, which I kind of joked is the, uh, you know, undecided path um, to, to figuring out what you want to do. But I actually think if you know that your heart is in working in a small business, so like working and having, you know, uh, no limit on responsibility where you just, you know, you have to figure things out as you go, um, find a group of people that are really good, like good. And, and you know, your, your own judgment is, is all you need in terms of, you know, hey, is this someone that I can learn a lot from? And just go work really hard. Like, I think your 20s should be all about experimentation. I don't think anybody ever told me that. I don't think I ever, it was certainly wasn't coursework, um, but go work at one, two, three startups, fail fast, learn from it. Um, if you succeed even better, but um, you know, I, I don't think there's any uh, playbook for figuring out what you want to do and, and learning the skills you need to do it. Just, just go work with some really smart people. And there's plenty of that in Indiana. There's plenty of that in Chicago. There's plenty of that in the Bay area. There's plenty of that everywhere in the world, but um you know, I, I think network into it and it's, it, people will always accept people that want to work hard. Like it's, it's just a, it's a thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, you know, I, I'll just add one thing is like, like something like 15 years ago, I was at an event where John Doerr spoke, John Doerr at Kleiner Perkins, one of the legendary VCs here in Silicon Valley invested in Amazon and Google and made a fortune. He was asked by a young person in the audience, how, I want to be an entrepreneur. What do I do? And he, his answer was like, right off the bat. Well, if you don't know what you're going to go do right now, don't, don't do something. Go get a job at a company that does, knows really well how to get stuff done and then watch how things get done and then wait until you've got to find something that you have a passion for to do. And then hopefully you'll find it. So I, I've always, that's yeah. my answer to that question. I would love to add just a tidbit to that. I think you guys both said it, but being an EC, this is pretty near and near and dear to me. Uh, I think just make sure that your students, especially I think this was coming from a professor when the question came out, uh, like go take an internship, go do a co-op, go work in the business world and see if you like that. If you don't like that, that's what I did. And that was amazing. And I had great mentors there. But then I realized exactly what Adam said. I want to take a swing in my 20s. Like I already did the work. I know I can come back to this later. So let me go take a couple big swings. And that's where I came up with it. And um, a lot of people, um, like two of my founders didn't know what they want to do. We just took the ideas from the other two, right? Like, and then we did, we took it from there, right? You don't have to be the person that comes up with the idea for the startup or anything like that. I don't know exactly when people become entrepreneurs or not. Some people do it in college. I felt like I knew it in high school, but um, that didn't stop me from doing internships. I think one of the worst things in ECE or any engineering is to wait to like your senior year to just get that job. The, the, the producer doing a great job of this too. Like it's more flexible than ever if you want to do an internship for a semester and, and come back. So I just recommend trying out both sides and then making that decision just like Adam and Bruce said. This is a great question. One thing I want to add on very quickly is that uh, trying out different things can also help you to understand what you hate what you want to avoid going into the future. For example, my first job, I was in corporate finance at low finance, but I hate like every month the routine is the same. So that helped me understand. I love dynamic. I love like smaller company who can make impact faster. Good. Great. Uh, well, Bruce, uh, the next question here I have on the list is, in your experience, when did you start raising funds from VCs relative to getting funding from government programs like SBIR and SCTR related? Are there a critical fraction of VCs who'd like to see a professional CEO for them to take your company seriously? 
Oh, wow. There's, there's a couple of different questions there. Who, I mean, I have never founded a company, so I, I'm not qualified to answer this question. Um, uh, it volunteers? Uh, I'll, I'll dive in there first and I feel free to dive in another one. I'll kind of call you out a little bit and on here, but I think there's a, there's two things here. It's like, there's general businesses where I don't think VCs put any idea of whether or not we need to be professional or you need to have tons of years of experience. Then there's other ones where it's, you're building missiles or you're building rocket science or you're building crypto. If you don't have experts on your team or expert mentors, you're going to get a little bit of pushback at some point from the VC level. Um, and so I think that answering the second question first, like I wouldn't want to work with uh, Anand if there was no experience on crypto, right? Like you want someone who knows crypto or some of these advanced things and they're not going to lose lots of money or security. Um, and it, so it depends a little bit on your idea, but I don't think you need it early on. Um, and, and then us personally, we did non-government money for the first two, three rounds. And then we had some government contracts come later. I'd, I think government money is great in a lot of cases, especially grants and things of that nature. I didn't know the two programs mentioned, um, but we, we did some other programs and I, I think it's great, but it's, it's sometimes not as fast and it's not willing to take as many risks uh, as sometimes other VC money. So just something to take into account that that usually means it's going to be a little bit later stage, uh, at least in my experience. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo the same thing. Like the, the pace of something that you're trying to get off the ground usually doesn't allow for waiting for the government turnaround. And so in the very, very early days, I, I would probably avoid the government program and let let VCs be your signal. I mean, VCs may not know everything about every space, but they're really smart thinkers and they can they can reason through a problem. And if there's something that you know has potential, you know, they'll they'll, they'll write a check for it, maybe a small check at the beginning, but you know, they'll they'll, they'll figure it out. And then if it doesn't, you know, if, if there's something that seems off about it, well, then use that signal, go back and revise the pitch and try again. Um, and then you know, professional CEO like. I actually think it's almost the opposite. Like, I'm not sure what a professional CEO is in this context. Like, is this a, a hired gun or is this somebody who's like a business person? But like, I don't think you really need either of them. I think, you know, there's plenty of examples of, you know, incredible businesses where engineers led them from, from day one till, you know, present day. And there's examples of businesses that, um, you know, the person never had a day of experience with the CEO in their life until they started a company and, and all of them work out. So, um, you know, I, I don't I don't think you need a, hire somebody who's done it before you know i'd like to weigh in briefly on this i i this could be a little controversial opinion but in my interaction with Purdue startups over the last 10 years there's so often a conversation around should we have a professional ceo and i would say if you live here in silicon valley this these aren't even words that mean anything like if you're gonna found a company you better know you better just go found that company if you think you're going to hire a ceo no good ceo and this is really controversial but i'm going to say my opinion no great ceo is going to come and work in your five person startup you're going to have to prove that there's a real business there now i mean it's perfectly common that once companies become five ten twenty fifty million dollar companies it's time to bring in professional CEOs, but you don't do it when there's five people in the company. <laughs> so there's an opinion. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll add on to that. I think it's a really good point, Bruce. And because I think the, the one of the most interesting traits that I've seen work with founders um, and just having lived and worked in the Valley for so long and surrounded by just incredible uh, people is that like there's a sense of adaptability, right? Like a founder, a CEO is, uh, you know, you're wearing just multiple hats, right? Or maybe the, the most common thing from day one till like the day you exit or even beyond is that you're always, always, always recruiting. Like that's the one thing that doesn't change. That's the only constant. But the everything else is our variables, right? Like, and you just need to know how to block and tackle. You need to know how to get, you know, just move on with the things that get thrown at you. So I would say that uh, as an early member of the founding team, if you were to wear that hat, just be prepared to do a lot of different things. And if at some point it feels like you are gravitating towards one specific business function, uh, then yes, it makes sense to bring on someone who can you know, lead the charge and, and, and be the person who can be the CEO. But out of the gate, just be prepared to do a lot. And, and the most important trait is just to be adaptable and be prepared for change. Great. Uh, we have lots of questions, uh, and I'm actually uh, clustering them into you know groups uh, dynamically here. But I think there's uh, an interesting one. This is from Leo, one of our uh, 
students here, international senior majoring in industrial engineering. He asks if given his status as an international student, where should I start with legal process and processes in order to begin my entrepreneurial journey? Yeah, good question. Does anybody have, I, I know yeah. this has been an issue at Purdue a long time. Candace, do you have uh, Yeah, expertise? I think I'll answer it. I tried different visas. <laughs> and the suggestion I have is that prepare early and consult with ISS and Purdue Foundry, they also have great program that can support you. So have those conversations as early on, as early as possible before you start the company. <laughs> Yeah, I would uh, don't have direct experience, but two of our founders are Turkish and I oversaw almost all legal. Um, I would say ask questions. There's almost always options is what I like to say. It depends a lot on your personal story. <laughs> like what visa you're going to get depends on something else. But there's some really great visas in America for undergraduates or graduates to get started with a business. Um, essentially, you can work almost as like an intern. I usually would start there and then there's better visas you can get. But there's some great places uh, in person. And then there are some great legal firms outside of like the, the in-person assets at Purdue that you should go talk to. But um, if, you, if, if you don't feel like you're getting a great answer, then uh, just try a different route. Like we said earlier today, there's some, some really, really great firms that can uh, do a quick call with you in an hour for free. And they'll give you the name of two or three visas that uh, may or may not be the best fit. Um. I think we may have time for just a couple, Bruce, maybe, maybe one more question too. We'll see how it goes. Okay. But next question on the list is um, a colleague who has a brand new cloud database optimization company and is also a uh, engineering alumna and now a professor and would love to be part of PAEN. Um, I get the question there is, uh, you know, what are some of the challenges specific to B2B companies as opposed to client facing companies? Um, I'm trying to think. Well, let's see. Uh, both Adam and Joe are primarily B two B. What what would you add? I guess I don't like challenges specific to B two B. It is a different market than B two C. So um, kind of goes back to almost the some of the anything from mentors to points of view. Like um, I love what we said earlier when we talked to mentors and we would ask other mentors, we had ask at the end of our slide, hey, we need to talk to somebody in this industry or we need to get a hold of somebody that's done B2B, not B2C, because it is a different market. It moves at a different speed. Um, it's a lot more, I think, predictable and higher value, but there's a lot more demands. Um, for that, like kind of it's a general, still a general question, just like challenges specific to it. Um, a lot of it's going to be like, convincing the buyer to buy from you. <laughs> These are not going to be low dollar amounts. They're not going to just like implement it. You're not going to be able to get a university to buy something company-wide uh, and roll it out right away. You're going to ha have to maybe work with small companies first and work your way up to enterprises. It's very, a very, very common problem. If you go straight to the enterprise, that's possible as well. Um, but usually then you're going to have to do a lot of work to win that first deal and, and, and learn a lot from it right away. Um, so the, the main call out I would say is the challenges, I, I would look at them differently. And when you read books or you try to get mentors, uh, do have some that are B2B focused, not B2C. It does move at a different speed and the feedback loops from the customer base are, are gonna be quite different. That's great. Uh, we have a bunch of questions related to how to connect with the Purdue uh, alumni entrepreneurs. And I just wanted to read out a few resources that are in the chat box. The, Purdue Alumni Entrepreneurship Network uh, that just launched a colleague from the Purdue Dial Ventures at dialventures.com here at Purdue uh, is also inviting uh, you all to uh, chat. Um, there's also uh, Purdue Ventures, uh, this ecosystem, there's an email address, uh, RTG, rtgibb at prf.org. Uh, and then a colleague, Eugenio Colorcielo has offered, he's on campus, would happy would be happy to discuss startups, ideas, or connections. Just wanted to kind of summarize some of the different resources that people are offering. Uh, and it's back to you, Bruce. I think we're just at time. Well, yeah, I think it, I want to be respectful of people's time. So I just want to thank uh, two thank yous. First and foremost, the four panelists. I mean, you guys, you guys are very busy running your companies, and I really appreciate you taking the time. This has been fantastic from my vantage point. And Arvind, I I want to thank you and the School of Engineering for offering us the venue. So I think it worked out very well. You bet. Thank you all. Thanks.